Cobble's Bridges a symbol of connection, progress, and individuality in our downtown cityscape. But they also hold a darker symbolism. Suicide is the number three cause of death nationwide in people from 10 to 35. The increase in the past five years has refocused attention to people who attempt suicide. But people jumping to end their lives is nothing new. The Jackson family lost their son, Chancey, 21 years ago. July 12, 1999, our 18-year-old son, Chancey Maurice Jackson, took his life by jumping off the Second Street Bridge. A breakup with a girlfriend, flunking out of summer school, and a wreck in his dad's car were the main stressors in Chancey's life, according to his dad, William, and stepmom, Wanda. After that car wreck in southern Indiana, Chancey was walking the three miles to his home in Louisville when he began to cross the Second Street Bridge, but he never made it to the other side. It's complicated, but it's simple. I mean, you try to figure out why it happened, where was God, and you ask all kind of questions about how could this happen to me, and why now of this, and you don't get many answers. After Chancey jumped off the Second Street Bridge, his body stayed under the water for two days. Then on the third day, his body was found down the river at the hydro plant. When the coroner came to the Jackson home to tell them Chancey was found, he gave Mr. Jackson three pictures of his body to identify him. And I remember looking at the pictures and they were grotesque. But I also remember taking that picture and kissing it and putting it in my heart. I loved him. Wanda and William kept their son's completion of suicide close to their hearts, not sharing details of the death publicly. As the three years have ticked by, the Jacksons opened their hearts to share what happened, just the beginning of the ripples of what happens when a person jumps off one of Louisville's bridges. At the University of Louisville's emergency department, Chelsea Hoops, clinical nurse manager of emergency psychiatric services, gets the opportunity to help those who attempt suicide and survive. They had this idea of something and it didn't work out like they thought it would. Um, and then some people are angry as well. So it's really just kind of getting with that patient on the one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one level where they're at. Chelsea struggles when looking around at her patients and seeing how young some of them are. Sometimes it's the first time they're reaching out for help because they're not comfortable talking to their peers or their family, again, because of the stigma about mental health. But it's a shared belief in the medical community. Talking about suicide more isn't going to increase the number of cases. In many cases, Dr. Taylor at Peace Hospital says his patients are relieved to have someone else bring it up to them. If somebody's thinking about suicide and talks about it, they're much less likely to do it. It's the ones who don't talk about it are the ones that we're gonna, that we're gonna see in the paper instead of in the hospital. Talking about suicide with your children, with your friends, or with your partner is a tough task. But with resources available to you online, in your community, you could be the person who saves someone's life. Why my boy? My, my son wasn't a drug dealer. He didn't run the streets. He wasn't a gang banger. He'd never been locked up. He's never been in trouble with the law. Never. So truly, why my boy? We don't understand. It's a question these parents may never know the answer to. My daughter so hurt by it that she felt like she had to move in his room just so she could fill him. Christian Gwen was a big brother. He was four here and she was three. A superb son. Everything I've asked for for my son, he's given it to me. He and his father, Nevada, were close, sharing a bond with no bounds. I started teaching my son to fish about five. Mm -hmm. Was he any good? Oh, he was better than, he got better than me. Yeah. He would catch first fish. The 19-year-old had finished high school and graduated from Job Corps over the summer. A life cut short just a week before Christmas on December 19th. Only thing I could do was scream his name. It was around 9.30 that Thursday night. His mother, Krista, got a call from a friend. She said, I'm telling you, you need to get the 43rd in market. Hurry up. There within minutes, and her husband close behind. He can actually see, see my son with the paramedics working on him, about to put him in the ambulance. And we're just asking the police, is that our boy? Rushed to the hospital, but Christian 
wouldn't make it. My son was hit two times. He was hit in the upper torso and one through the hand. His parents say he was walking on the sidewalk the night that he died, leaving Indies with a few friends. That's when she says a car circled the block. Someone rolled down the window and started shooting. His friends got away. What he's trying to tell us was Chris wasn't paying attention or didn't see him and got caught. Christian's friends described the car they believe they saw to his parents. It was told to me by numerous accounts that it was a 2006 maroon Chevy Impala. Now every car we see that look like it, it we wonder. It seems like it. They say Christian had a 10 p.m. curfew and he never missed it. He would have been home in 30 minutes. It happened only two blocks from their home, a corner that's hard to even drive past nowadays. But the Gwyns find comfort knowing there were people here during their son's final breaths. One man took his hood off and put it under my boy's head. So his head would lay on the concrete. And another woman stood by him and told him that his parents loved him. She didn't even know us. It makes us feel a little bit better that somebody was there telling my son that he was loved. Because he, he was. Alone. He wasn't alone. His heart ventricles, some of his muscles, and Christian's eyes were donated. He gave somebody sight. And I'm just hoping my son can see life again. that maybe whoever has his eyes will have to venture and see the things the way he saw. And to those who saw his murder, that know who pulled the trigger, Nevada and Krista are begging for you to speak up. You don't have to say, well, I so-and-so seen it. Just say, I think I know this might be important. I got some information. You don't have to leave your name. Just anything. What would that mean to you all? That would mean a lot. Everything. It would mean everything to have some kind of closure. It's no secret, stories from the greatest generation are fading with every passing day. Of the 16 million Americans who served in World War II, only 300,000 are left. Some of their stories documented in film, others in museums. But for Melissa Swan's parents... Let's see, they were just stored in here in this potato chip can for decades. More than 100 letters covered in dust untouched for 75 years. My dad was a soldier in the Army in World War II. The two were inseparable until the war tore them apart in 1944. Sam was 22, Mary just 19 and pregnant with their first child. So he started out as a cook in the Philippines when he got there. But soon, the battles on the Philippine Islands, everybody was in battle. This one talks about the D-Day invasion. Revealing a history far greater than the one Melissa had known when her parents were living. We'd never read them. We would ask my mother if we could read the letters. At family gatherings, we'd say, oh, let's get the letters out. Let's read the letters. And she was like, oh, they're all redacted, they're boring, you don't really want to do that. Their contents kept secret until this year, when Melissa decided it had been long enough. And they weren't boring. They were just intensely personal. But as, as much as they are a love story, they're also a history lesson. Their letters would be delayed for weeks at a time. So one day he writes, I got 16 letters today. And he's so happy because the letter before that was saying, what am I, the forgotten man? I never get a letter. It was the beginning of what would be a 73-year marriage. If they wanted to say something suggestive, they'd say, you know what I mean, wink, wink. The way he teases her, the way she scolds him, the way, you know, all of that still goes on, even though they're thousands of miles away and, and could be gone tomorrow. At times, the couple had nothing not even a dollar. He asked her at one point for, for $3. And at another point she said, I didn't need all the money you sent me. I have a dollar left over, so I'm sending it back. And to think, I mean, a dollar bill. I mean, that's what takes my breath away. Comparing their struggles with today's? We have no idea. There, are a lot of parallels with this pandemic, with women working 
as there were during World War II. I mean, mothers had to find childcare. Um, if the childcare fell apart, the job fell apart. Never knowing when it all would end. You'll see the Red Cross stationery that we have that he wrote from the hospital. Toward the end of his service, Sam suffered from bleeding ulcers. Doctors doubted he'd ever make it home. They write letters, October. I'm sure I'll be home by Christmas. November, well, it doesn't look like it's gonna be Christmas this year. Some days I would just have to walk away. The last letter in the pile, nothing short of heartbreaking. I figured it out yesterday and finally have concluded that nothing short of a miracle will get me home before February. Sort of disheartening, isn't it? I guess I was merely stargazing before. Even though I can't be home for Christmas, do me a favor and pretend I'm there with you. I will be in my dreams. That's next best. And while we don't know when Sam finally came home to Mary, we can smile knowing he did. They made a wonderful life for themselves. In Louisville, Brooke Hash, WHAS 11 News. These days, when distance is our friend. It's kind of crazy because everybody is self-isolating. Neighbors in the Tyler Park community. Okay, but make sure you stay six feet away. Are coming together without leaving their homes. Trying not to go crazy, all of us. I know we can't get close right now, but it's a way to uh, show each other we support each other. They're calling it Front Porch Fridays. A time to grab your coffee and head outside. We see our neighbors Ernst and Joe over there and there's our neighbors Ray and Tessa. Hey Ray, hey Tessa. <laughs> so yeah, we're just, we're just having fun with it right now. There are many, many, many among us here. The world definitely feels like it's turned upside down right now, but uh, things like neighbors can help you get through it and uh, seeing everybody on the front porches and just waving as people are walking by. Uh, can really help to lift your spirits. For some, working from home isn't new. Yeah, here on my porch. Anyways. One now chocked full of rainbows and hope. Yeah, we just hang out, feet, and watch TV more or less at the current time. But these days, it's different. That first 70 degree day, we were all out all day long. It was, it was pretty cool. It was like we were working together, but not at all. That's for America. Hang in, hang in. In the Highlands, Brooke Hash, WHAS 11 News.